Welcome to Charity Matters Podcast. Mr. Rogers' mother said, always look for the helpers. I'm Heidi Johnson, nonprofit founder, lifelong helper, and your host. I've been interviewing the helpers for a decade with my blog, and I'm so excited to finally be sharing these inspiring conversations with our new podcast. Join me as we learn the challenges and stories of innovators, entrepreneurs, and modern day heroes who set out to solve the problems of humanity. Today, our guests are Mary and Ed Ternan, the founders of the new nonprofit Song for Charlie. I'm excited to share their amazing journey and our inspirational conversation. I have to begin by just saying how excited I am to talk to you and how um, truly sorry I am that we're having this conversation on some levels, but I'm so thrilled that you're making this really beautiful lasting legacy um, for Charlie. What a beautiful tribute of love um, for a really remarkable young man. So I'm really excited to have this conversation and find out how you're taking all of this and turning it into something fantastic. So thank you guys just for joining me and for being so open to talking about all of this. It's, it's, it's a crazy, it's a crazy, crazy time, but why don't we start and why don't you tell us a little bit about Song for Charlie and what your organization does and what its mission is? Well, Song for Charlie is an organization that we started after our youngest son died in May of 2020 of fentanyl poisoning. And we found ourselves thrown into uh, an issue that we'd never even heard about. Um, Charlie died after taking what he thought was a legitimate prescription medication. Um, the mistake he made was he went online and got a Percocet pill and it turned out that it wasn't Percocet. It was a counterfeit pill made of fentanyl. So we had the double whammy shock of finding that our, hearing that our son had died and couldn't figure out how. And uh, very quickly, like the next morning, we're told by law enforcement, we suspect fentanyl. And then the question is, well, what is fentanyl? What's what's going on here? And how do you even spell right. fentanyl? Right. Right. Yeah. Right. But so we, we started doing a little bit of frantic research to just try to figure out what might have happened to Charlie. And we were shocked to find out that fentanyl and fake pills are a, a problem that's known in some circles. Law enforcement and EMTs and medical people are all aware of this problem and really worried about it and the pace at which it's accelerating and spreading. Um, but the kids don't seem to understand that these fake pills are out there. Nor do the parents, I don't think. Parents. I don't think. Right. <laughs> Nor are the parents thinking that their kids would ever do such a thing. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, kids in college do all sorts of crazy things and and you know the tragic thing is that you don't know what's in any of these things you have no idea and and you know the kids have a couple beers and someone says hey why don't you take one of these you're like oh okay sounds like a great idea and you think that they're taking an aspirin you know they just don't they don't well, think i'm so the mother trusting. yeah they're right. so trusting right having three boys i mean frontal lobe is not formed. I mean, they, they do, they do things sometimes and they just don't even, they're just naive. Exactly. Mary, I completely agree with that. So, I mean, obviously it's, it's still so new. Um, this, this only happened seven, eight months ago. Um, not very long ago. And yet when did you decide you were going to start a nonprofit? I mean, when did you say we, we have to do something. I mean, because you're still dealing with so much. And to take this on, um, this entrepreneurial journey um, of starting a new business that relies on the kindness of others uh, is a huge undertaking. So what? when did you decide that you had to act? Well, we just don't want, uh, first we wanted to just inform and get the information out because we don't want, we want kids to know and we want parents to know and educators, um, and we just don't want anybody to experience what we're experiencing. I mean, if we had known, we could have had a conversation with Charlie, and, and um, but we just, 
it's as all parents would feel, this is like the worst thing that you can ever go through as a parent. And yeah. we can be of some help. That's what we're going. Yeah. And I, I would say that part of it is um, kind of how we're channeling our grief. And I think that, um, you know, we've gotten some grief counseling and, and um, it's not like anybody advised us to do this, but when we dove into the problem and, and, and went online, we very quickly became members of this club. Uh, and it's not only the Grieving Parents Club, but then it's parents like us who are literally shell-shocked to find out that their kid died from something that they didn't even know was out there. Um, and so, and then we had identified this kind of information gap where um, the story's in the news, but the kids don't understand. So we thought, is there something we can do? And and then it's a little bit of that feeling of, you know, if not us, who, right? right. I mean, we're blessed with a lot of friends and we have a lot of connections in um, the education space, specifically the private Catholic space where Mary and I grew up and all our siblings and cousins are involved. We all send our kids so we can pick up the phone and talk to educators and they'll take our calls. So we started networking a little bit and thought, you know, maybe we can add some value here. Maybe there's something we can do. That's, I mean, that's incredible. And as someone who uh, has walked this journey in a different path, uh, you know, I started a nonprofit in 2003, the year after my mother tragically died. Um, and, and I will say that service heals in remarkable and magical ways. There is something that I wish the world would know. I interview nonprofit founders all the time. We have 1.7 million nonprofits in the United States. We have 30,000 in Los Angeles. And I would say 80% of the people that I have interviewed have had some sort of tragedy or loss. And they're determined if they just help one person, then they are going to do take their pain and use it as fuel. And I would say 20% of the people I've interviewed have had a near miss and an and a, a wake up call and an enormous moment of gratitude that has channeled them into um, starting a nonprofit. Cause it's not easy work. And you guys are just beginning the journey. It's hard. Starting any business is hard, but starting a business that relies on other people's kindness is really hard. So what do you think some of your biggest challenges are either have been or are going to be in this journey of of, of um, Song for Charlie. Well, we had an interesting conversation last night with um, a foundation board member, and we recently completed uh, our virtual launch, and uh, we were happy to have raised some funds. Um, and I think that the, the challenge getting started, it seems like, is going to be uh, covering our overhead. The, and Mary and I are, are, we think right now that this is something that we want to devote our full attention to. And some of the foundation people we've spoken to have said, that's what we want. We prefer to fund foundations that are kind of full, full time enterprises and not part time. And of course, if we're going to do that, we have to cover our household expenses, right? We have to kind of walk away from other income streams and make enough money to survive. Right. So, you know, when I say we're not trying to make a killing, we're just trying to make a living, you know, and uh, and that's what the nonprofit world is about. Um, but finding those unrestricted funds, a donor who gets us and says, you're the couple, you're the ones, we want to make sure that your overhead is covered and you can focus on program fundraising. That's what will, that's will be our challenge, I think, in the next year. Right. And, and it, it really is one of the most fascinating things as an executive director of a nonprofit myself. Um, it, foundations and, law, and donors really don't want to pay to keep the lights on. That's just operational is not sexy. Um, they want to pay for the meat of the program. They want to know that they change a person's life. Keeping the lights on does do that indirectly, but it's just not, it's much harder to get those donations, um, for operational resources. So it's definitely, um, it's definitely not 
not all this easy work. And that it, that's the grindstone, right? That's that is right. it, that is definitely the challenge. So, I mean, I always say the bucket is heavy when you're doing this work. It's it's not like most nonprofits don't have huge staffs. Most nonprofit founders at the end of the day, it's it's you. Like this is your baby literally and figuratively. And and it's not that you can hand it to someone else and say, hey, can you just take care of this and, well, you know, why I deal with something else? It, it The buck kind of stops with you. So when the bucket's heavy and the days are hard and, you know, you're dealing with grief, you're dealing with starting a new business, you're dealing with life, and you still have to do your laundry, I mean, life still happens, How? what fuels you guys to keep going? Charlie mm. and helping others. Mm. Six from us. And don't you think Charlie is just totally guiding you in all of this? I mean, Absolutely. I mean, I just, I just think you have to, you have to feel his presence guiding, guiding in this. And I know that, um, that for me, when I had, when we were starting spiritual care, um, there were so many um, miraculous moments of grace, things that you just can't explain, but it just, they were signals that I was somehow on the right path um, that that just told me that to keep going. Have you had any of those moments where you yeah, just kind it, of know? Yeah, and the way we talk about it is, we did a lot of exploration at looking at different aspects of this very complicated problem um, because the issue we're dealing with has to do with, well, it's communication and miscommunication and it's a misunderstood issue. It's a complex issue re- that, that touches Internet safety and relations with China and Mexican cartels and drug trafficking and border control and and kids and, and so all these different things. So we explored a lot of stuff and I put it to Mary that I, we're not breaking down doors, but we're knocking on a lot of doors. And strangely, they just keep opening. I will I will keep knocking till someone closes the door and says, no, no, you know, you just really, you're wasting your time. There's nothing you can add. There's nothing you can do. And that just hasn't happened. The doors just have continued to open. And it really has been kind of cosmic. Some of these connections that mm-hmm. we've been able to make have been pretty incredible. You know, I, there's so many people that I talk to and they and they say, you, you just don't understand, like, the craziest thing happened when I was starting. And it was so crazy. And everyone has these stories, these moments. And, and, it, and it isn't crazy. It just isn't mm-hmm. crazy. I mean... I shared one of mine um, with someone I was talking to, and I said uh, we were doing a Field of Dreams benefit for our first fundraiser for um, spiritual care, and I had run into a girl I had not seen since my mommy and me class, and she said, oh, Heidi, I hear you're starting a nonprofit. You know, how can I help you? And I said, oh, just if you get the word out, that'd be great. And she said, Heidi, you know I'm Kevin Costner's assistant. I said, what? No, no, I didn't know that. And she said, let me, let me really get the word out and let's see what we can do. And, you know, I'm, I'm in the grocery store, right? It stops me dead in my tracks. And I was like, okay, mom, I hear you. I know this. Thank you. Here, here we go. Let's, let's keep going. And, and I think that those moments, um, they're comforting and they, they reassure you. And, and I think that you're going to have a lot more of those. As you move forward, yeah, and make Absolutely. note of them. Yeah. Make note the of them. The aha moments that are that are guiding us. Yeah, because they really are. Um, they really are there, and I think that they're they're there just to remind you that you're just doing beautiful work. So I know you guys are just starting. So kind of asking about impact is is a reverse question. So I think it's, I'm going to ask, like, what do you think you want your impact to be? Impact is a question, and you may know this or you may not. Um, I know, Ed, you've worked a lot with foundations, so you do. But foundations are always asking nonprofits 
tell us about your impact. And, you know, I run a leadership organization. So how do you measure leadership or how do you measure a life that you save from a child that doesn't take fentanyl because they've been educated? So, so impact can be such a, um, a blessing and a curse for nonprofits. What do you think you want your impact to be? Yeah, just putting it into uh, kind of a stretch goal. Um, we think that our our mission is about changing a mindset. We're not pushing for legislation or, um, you know, tougher laws or anything like that. We're trying to reach kids and, and change the mindset. And so uh, our, our stretch goal might be something like, any eighth grader today enters college um, four or five years from now with the idea that they would never put a random pill in their mouth, that that's just no longer socially acceptable. And everybody knows that you just don't do that because it's not safe. Um, now, how we measure that, I, I don't know how we're going to measure that. It might just be in terms of kind of reach, being able to measure how many classes and students and website traffic and hits on our videos and so forth. But that might be one way to measure it. But that's kind of the stretch goal is to make it socially unacceptable among people from, say, 14 to 24 to take any kind of pill if you don't know where exactly where it came from. I mean, I think that that is awesome. And education is definitely um, is definitely needed in that area. Have you guys thought about partnering with any other um, kind of drug, anti-drug organizations or looking at partnerships for other nonprofits that do something similar? We have um, informal relationships with other nonprofits that we've come across. And we actually received our first grant from uh, from an organization called the Partnership for Safe Medicines, which their mandate is broader than just uh, fentanyl, but it's about counterfeit medications across the board. Um, we haven't thought yet about um, partnering with others. Uh, you know, we'll kind of get our feet under us um, before we do that. And we have to kind of fit in where, figure out where we fit into drug awareness in the drug awareness world. Cause we're really about updating those messages. Right. I know it's, it's, it's really, um, it's so interesting as, as a parent, I think about, um, even the education that my three boys had and the, the six year age gap and all of them that it started out with, you know, years ago when my oldest, who's 25, there was a lot more messaging about anti-drugs. And then as administrations and things change and politics and policies and new new um, nonprofits or new issues come to light, others get get pushed to the bottom, you know. And and so I, I do think it's something that's desperately needed and that is we're not seeing or hearing about it um, in the media it, half as much as we should. Although we're hearing about these the tragedies, we're not hearing any more about how to prevent them or what we can do. So I think that that's, right. that that's. And our, our, our hot buttons are going to be, first of all, our, our message is very non-judgmental. Um, and we think that's important. So this is not the drugs are bad talk. And what's happened with fentanyl and these other synthetics that are coming down the pipeline is the narrative really has to be updated because the typical narrative is, be careful with drugs because if you do something too much and or for too long, you become dependent on it, maybe physically addicted one day, and may eventually you may die from it. Now we have kids in middle school, the first or second time they experiment taking a Xanax at a party, they die because it's poison. Right. So the new message is more of a, a warning. We want to keep, tell kids you have to navigate this new drug use landscape that's out there because of these synthetics. There's things that are sold under false pretenses and that are, are very deadly and you don't have, well, you won't have a chance to get addicted. Um, so that's the education piece that we want to do in a, and it's, we feel terrible. These kids today with COVID and everything else, all the other stress they're under, they're under. It's just, we feel sometimes like we, we're piling on, uh, with more bad news, but we really come across, try to come across as, this is really, you have to educate yourself about this, this new issue that's out there and take care of one another and protect one another from this new poison that's, that's been put on the market. 
Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So what, um, how do you think you're going to disseminate your program? Have you thought about how it's going to be, are you going to be partnering with schools? Are you going to be, do, are people going to get brochures or information? Well, we have a, as Ed said earlier, a strong relationship with the Jesuit communities. So we're working with Santa Clara, where Charlie went to school. We did a documentary um, that should be released on Charlie's story in March or April. And so we're going to use that video and share it with other Je- Jesuit universities and high schools. And we've got the OK from Loyola, uh, University of San Diego. Um, yeah, we're working with Jesuit. yeah. Uh, high schools in Arizona, yeah. Those are kind of our low-hanging fruit people who will take our call, our friends in the Jesuit education community. And the partnership is kind of like what we know is everything we've learned about this, the, the new landscape uh, created by fentanyl and fake pills. And what the schools know is how kids um, take information, how they absorb information. So we're going to learn from each other. We have kind of a, an advisor, academic advisory team put together. We'll learn from each other. And then the idea we think is short videos, narrated, animated videos um, that we'll push on our website that we'll co-create with some schools that they can use for themselves. We think kids teaching kids is a really good way to do it. So if we can get the schools to say, you know, we would say maybe here's a learning guide and have the kids do their own projects and create their own um, uh, presentations and so forth that they would share with classes. So we want to get the kids engaged. Our, our three-point plan is basically go where they are, speak their language, and get them talking. And uh, we're working with schools to figure out how we can do that. I love that. You know, I run a Catholic youth leadership organization is my day job. Um, and I work with 122 elementary schools and 31 Catholic high schools. And, um, and we do peer to peer model where children teach children. I mean, we serve 3,500 kids a year, but we only have three employees and our kids, um, our high, our college kids train our high school kids and our high school kids train our middle school kids. And the model is incredibly effective because especially when you're talking about a topic like this, they don't want to hear it from a teacher. They don't want to hear it from a parent. They want to hear it from someone older, hipper, cooler than they are. And so I think you are spot on with your three-step um, program. For someone who's been doing this for almost a decade um, and seeing how effective um, teaching leadership is, uh, this way, I think you can definitely have the same impact with the peer-to-peer model. So I think that that's awesome. Great. Um, yeah, I think you're definitely you're definitely on um, you're definitely on your way, and I'm happy to be a resource for you as well as you. Thank you. As you <laughs> <laughs> we could have an off uh, an off. Uh, off-air conversation, side conversation yeah. about all of this because I have some ideas for you as well. So Great. I know you guys are in the middle of, of just dealing with so much right now. I mean, grief can be crippling and and unfunctioning and can shut down every system. And it's sometimes hard to restart when it hits. And and even to just to, you know, do the most basic functions when when grief hits is is just it's debilitating and so i'm i have such admiration that you are in the middle of grief and taking on this this journey this entrepreneurial journey but what what life lessons have you guys learned in the past few months there's so much that happens and when there's loss there's rebirth and when there's loss there's growth and it's it's the only upside. But what what do you think the lessons um, that you've learned from this event, Mary? What do you think? Uh, well, you know, being a Catholic and ministering to our sick and the elderly for the last and the dying for the last almost thirty years at Holy Family as their gerontologist, um, you know, I was always there walking with our people in the last stages of their life or illnesses. And um, what it's really given me is um, just, again, really appreciating every second. Um, 
because life has its twists and turns and and if we don't have our faith and to ask God and Charlie to walk with us during these very, very difficult times from hour to hour, um, then why are we here if we can't love and care for one another? And our support from our friends and our family um, have been just extraordinary. Um, so that's been given us, that's given us the light to kind of get out of bed and, and just tackle the day and what would Charlie want us to do and, and to do it with dignity and grace. Well, when you think about you have given your life for decades to serve other people. You have lived a life of service long before Mary, long before starting Song for Charlie. You have lived this life. And and I think that um, sometimes the grace you don't even realize that now it's all coming back. Those gifts you've given of yourself so completely for so long and now everyone's coming to rally to give back to you mm-hmm. and to help launch this effort. So I think mm-hmm. that there's something so beautiful in that. And mm-hmm. not that you've ever given expecting anything, because that's not at all who you are. But that's the beauty of giving. You don't give with an expectation. Right. You give to what you want to do. Right. Right. And to walk the walk. And to, you know, I think of the Blessed Mother and been asking for her help um, because she, you know she knows what I'm feeling as a mother. Um, so I think that's really important to kind of channel into that and just making time and space for prayer and continued prayer and and um, just again walk the walk. This is what we're supposed to do um, to share our love and care for others and take care of ourselves and be very caring to ourselves and listen to our intuition and and hearts and souls of what we need to do every day. You know, it can change from day to day, but um, the most important thing is, you know, uh, just walking, walking the walk. Amen. Amen. Ed, what about you? What do you think? How do you think these past few months have, besides rock your world, changed, changed you? Um, I think about, um, priorities you know i think about um that old and we're, we're dating ourselves now but that old steve martin comedy routine where he talks about getting small right and and that you know i really am just i'm getting small um i'm focusing on what's important one day at a time one step at a time uh you know knock a few little things off our list that keep us making moving forward but uh you know really focus on our our other two kids and our families and our relationships and, and, um, you know, really set the priorities. Um, that's kind of how I, it's affected me. You know, they say don't sweat the small stuff, but at the same time, the small stuff is important and that's what we're focused on now. Mm, that's beautiful. That is truly, truly, truly beautiful. Well, I think that the world is feeling, um, Lost in different ways, not as as enor- the enormity of your loss, but the world is is reassessing exactly what you're saying, what's important, and I think that we've all had a little more time and space to pause and reflect on that and think about how important what we have is and these moments of gratitude, even in loss, why the planet is experiencing loss right now from their children going to school or seeing their family or their friends. Um, It's like we're having this, you know, international loss and trying to find gratitude and grace in all of it. I think you're certainly showing us how to do that. Most definitely. I think you're a living example of, of how to live and, and how to funnel pain into something so beautiful. What a beautiful legacy. I am a hundred percent sure that, Charlie is with us right now and smiling down on on all of this and we'll continue to bless you on this journey and I'm really excited to keep to keep following where you're going but tell us where we can support you where we can follow you where we can donate where we can learn more Thank where you. can we the, find uh, yes yeah, songforcharlie.org is our website um, we have an Instagram page that's 
thankfully being run by 20 something. So they know what they're doing. <laughs> uh, and that is song for Charlie with the number four and okay. Instagram. Uh, we're just starting our Twitter page. Um, so you can find us online. Uh, you can support us online and, um, uh, you can reach us there for more information. Send us an email if you want to help volunteer, ask questions, get involved, or make a, a financial donation. Uh, that's where you can find us, songforcharlie.org. Perfect. Well, I can't um, thank you enough for for sharing your journey, for taking this and, like I said, turning something very difficult into something really beautiful and um, what a gorgeous legacy you are leaving and how many lives Charlie and you are going to change with getting this message out. So thank you so much for sharing it. And I'm really um, excited that we got to talk today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you for your time and your prayers and your love. Absolutely. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the Charity Matters Podcast. I really enjoyed talking to our guest today, Marion Ed Ternian, about what it takes to start a nonprofit that changes people's lives. I think Ed's comment about getting small and focusing on what's really important on our families and our relationships was so inspiring and true. To learn more about these modern day heroes and entrepreneurs, or if you'd like to reach out to us, visit us at charity-matters.com or connect with us on Instagram at Charity Matters. If you enjoyed our conversation, we'd love it if you shared this with your friends and family, because together we can make a difference. One small act of kindness at a time.